her any prizes, um, has told me I'm not allowed to give her any awards, but who is someone that has been a mentor to me in my work here, who has been around doing this longer than I have. She has much more patience than I do. I'm like, we need change now. And she's like, well, you know, we need to work, work together. She's taught me a lot about collaboration, about staying above the fray of, of some of the drama and the nonsense. I'm not always successful with that. <laughs> but I wanted you all to hear her journey to advocacy. We are just parents, but I think if you follow the advocacy movements of a lot of, not just healthcare, but just um, all sorts of movements have been started by parents. With, it's not a matter of how much money we have, it's not a matter of how much education we have. Um, I am no different than any of you. And Mary Beth may be a, a superior human being, but <laughs> honestly, I need, I need you to know a particular brand of advocacy that goes on. You probably are not you know, seeing it because it's not, um, it's not loud, it's not about uh, the person doing it, but someone who is admired by many, many people in the field and has been, have been convinced through her dogged, uh, <laughs> her dogged um, collaboration with other people rather than arguing with people. And she's gonna tell you about her journey, quite literally, and then we're going to talk about how we, people like us, um, can get all of you to take a role in your local, your regional uh, areas, or in your fields of interest, the thing about eating disorders that just burns you up, how you can get involved, and you can share, we can share what we want FEAST to do. So, Mary Beth Kroll. There's a lot of difference between Laura and I. I had slippers on last night and she had heels. You know, we just keep, we kind of complement each other a little bit. So anyway, I'll start out with, with my journey. Um, when Laura asked me to consider speaking about my journey into this collaboration in the field, my mind went in all kinds of directions about collaboration. I remember times during this trip when I thought that I was back in the 70s and 80s where autism was, and uh, parents were frequently blamed for their child's illness and kept out of treatment. And I thought, oh, as Yogi Berra would say, it's like deja vu all over again. <laughs> I knew I needed to keep alert and find the ED specialists that treated eating disorders neurodevelopmentally. It's literally been a journey, and there has not been a yellow brick road. <laughs> so. I began with thinking about collaboration um, during the treatment with goal, the goal being wellness. Although I didn't know anything about, I didn't know anything about eating disorders. I do know a great deal about behavior, behavior modification, brain disorders, working systems, uh, education, healthcare, insurance. I'm a speech and language pathologist that started a program for three to five year old um, autistic spectrum disorder children in, the, in 1980. Um, we included families every step along the way. We knew that they knew their child better than we did, even though we knew the disorder better than they did. And we teamed with them about history, evaluation, and ongoing treatment. Little did I know how useful this experience was going to be with helping my daughter. This journey was mentally, physically, and financially exhausting and took us to locations we never intended to visit. So, 2003, I began without an ED education. I trusted the professionals that I connected with through the university <laughs> that my daughter was <laughs> attending and then on the internet. It got us started, but I wanted to understand this illness better. You're gonna see mileage as that'll come up on that. I traveled many miles on the road to wellness for education and treatment. In 2004, I sought information from Meta and NIDA. I started to attend their conferences and gain information from the experts. I also traveled to California three times in six weeks, including spending the last week of treatment near the residential treatment center 
to learn how to help our daughter when she came home. Generally, I found the professionals in this field to be very dedicated and thoughtful. I began to construct a yellow brick road. And I think you're going to see some similarities. I, you know, yesterday I was very happy. Now you're getting a parent perspective of the people in the field and the history that, that Craig and everybody was talking about. Many of the professionals that helped my family are here at this conference. They took the time to speak to me about my child, often for 30 or 60 minutes at a time. I think that you'll find them approachable here at Feast. In 2005, I found that I began to gather the information that matched our family's needs and let go of information that just didn't apply to us. I know this will get a good one. I, I put this one <laughs> at this meeting. At NIDA in Denver, I connected to Dr. Walter Kay, better known to some here as Sir Walt, and he helped me understand how temperament and good traits could come together to go bad, and that maybe you can have too many good traits, especially when you're a person that has to do a good job at everything. Also that year, I met a woman named Robbie Munn, who was a board member of NIDA and she shared her family history of eating disorders. Her mother, niece, and daughter all battled eating disorders. <coughs> Here's Robbie getting ready for her daughter's wedding, and she wanted me sh to share this with you about her wishes for her daughter. She said to me, what is crucial to me is that she was able to gradually arrive at a place where her choices about her life were more norm numerous and easily identified and more fully achieved she has a chance to have a full life, and that is all I would ever want for any child of mine. By 2006, fewer trips were needed for treatment. I met Kelly Klump, then president of the Academy for Eating Disorders, and Susan Ringwood, the director of BEAT. Maybe she's watching. Hi, Susan. Uh, and and th that's the leading charity for eating disorders in the UK at the NIDA conference in Bethesda. I also began meeting many other family members. Here's Joan Reederer, mom, family, advocate, roommate, friend. As you can see, the yellow brick road began to grow. At NIDA, I asked Dr. Thomas Ensel, director of the National Institute of Mental Health. I thought it was, everybody thought it was unique, but I said, here's the main man, why don't we get him to tell us what EDs are from his perspective in 2006. And he did in writing, and that letter is on the NIDA and FEAST website. And it's helped some people with insurance issues. And he noted that eating disorders are brain disorders, and that appropriate treatment can work. That's what I needed to hear to stay calm and carry on. My education and networking helped prepare me for collaboration needed for treatment. As you can see, I traveled many miles. Treatment required collaboration with many people and agencies. I was grateful that my profession had taught me how to work with many systems. I knew that our family needed to unite to help our daughter get well and support each other just as you would with any serious medical illness. We became, and still are, Team Kroll. Ed Tyson was the person that helped me with insurance issues. Um, and he, he made a point of letting me know that you need to know your plan and get a copy of it, I guess, is this morning, asking for individual medical and mental health case managers so that you don't have to tell your story over and over again. Get a copy, <laughs> get a copy of the guidelines that they use to make decisions. <laughs> All right, or else you're not going to get insurance. <laughs> Included stopping destructive behaviors, nutrition restoration, stabilization of social emotional skills, selection of healthy life choices based on her personality traits and other individual factors, and development of useful coping strategies. Oops. There we go. During treatment, I want you all to remember, you know your child best. 
You know who they were before they got sick. Let treatment team members know who your, what their strengths, their weaknesses, their interest areas are, and help them apply those to treatment goals for you. For instance, I knew that Maggie, my lovely grand puppy, would be the most useful thing to our daughter and family. Although we were not consulted about family, development, or health history, I provided it anyway. My motto became, first do no harm. You need to stay involved, let providers know that you are the one that will be with your child for a lifetime and that you are a member of that team. If treatment is not at home, be sure that, that you include a plan for heading home. If, well, if your child is an adult, you might need somebody like Beth. You need to meet with a coach who guides your family and communicates between your child's professional team and treatment team and family. We were lucky enough to have Beth in that role for us. As my daughter became well and got stabilized and took charge of her life, I began my tr transition to advocacy. With this definition of ag advocacy in mind, I began to search for an attainable goal that could be embraced by all of the organizations that I was connected to. There were a few concerns dear to my heart which I had developed during treatment. Non-ED specialists knew very little about EDs and some were actually clueless and harmful. There were not enough ED specialists available leading to too much travel for treatment and education. The death rate of these illnesses was certainly unacceptable, and some of these deaths were preventable through education of general health care providers. My goal always was to establish standard of care. That's been consistent. This is a quote from an email I wrote to Laura in September 2008. In discussing with this with ED specialists, I often re received responses like this one from an adolescent medical specialist. I agree with the idea that one of the serious problems we face as a field is lack of consistency, standard of care, as prim primary care providers encounter eating disorders. We should assume that some don't have any training and would benefit from any information that erases, raises, raises awareness. Others probably have some of the same misunderstandings that the general public have about eating disorders. And a well-known um, neuropsychiatrist said to me, there are many me mental health providers who are not trained or are ill-informed, afraid, and generally not interested. And so my journey continued. By 2007, I was no longer attending meetings for the treatment of my daughter. I had serious discussions with Beth from Meta, Lynn Grief from Nita, Kitty Weston from the EDC, Kelly Klump, the then president of the AED. Beth helped me understand what the various organizations did. It was sort of like alphabet soup to me at that point. Lynn directed me to the AED since I was interested in educating general health care professionals. And Kelly encouraged us to join AED. So Joan, Laura, we got involved. We started, they were looking for family perspective and we came there, and Katie Weston was already a, a professional involved. Laura and Joan that year joined an AED plenary session on caregivers organized by Susan Ringwood of BEAT, and we were getting connected and communicating our needs and goals. That year, I also initiated the first parent, family, friends news work, <laughs> network newsletter written by parents for parents. I also met Mary Ellen Clausen, who is the founder of Ophelia's Place and an ad parent and advocate, and Rich Kripe, a special, an ED specialist and past president of the Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine, better known as SAM. In 2008, Joan and I attended the AED Medical Care Special Interest Group, and Ovidio Bermudez put us on the agenda to discuss the reduction of preventable deaths in eating disorders. We didn't have to sell our idea much because in the room there was a doctor who had just lost a patient that week um, due to ignorance of appropriate care in the ER. 
I had selected this topic for discussion because there are so many con controversial topics in the field that I thought to myself, who can argue with reducing the preventable death rate by dissemination of basic medical information to healthcare prof professionals? Many more family advocates and FEAST members were present and communicating at NIDA. FEAST sponsored a family dinner at NIDA to provide time for families to connect and support each other. I also met with Judith Banker, the new ADD president. So they let me, I kept just work in the room. <laughs> this is when I seriously began to connect, communicate, and collaborate with Laura who from my perspective was feast at that point in time. I knew that I had the support of all of these organizations to move forward with my goals. Needless to say, the Medical Care SIG and Judith Banker heard our message. Judith created the AED Medical Care Standards Task Force during her presidency. Unfortunately, the AED meeting in Mexico was canceled due to H1N1 that year, and the task force was unable to meet in person. Cindy Bulick became another support and sounding board for me, and Doug Bunnell, he was hearing our messages, and families were getting less blame and more inclusion. NIDA created the NIDA Navigator program to have parents with training speak to other parents with training, with other parents in their area. In 2010, the Medical Care Standards Task Force created a document that came to consensus on general information about early recognition and medical management of eating disorders. It had a long title and became better known as the AED Eating Disorder Guide to Medical Management. The first edition of the guide was introduced at the AED meeting in Austria and then at NIDA in New York City after they announced the results of their recent survey that, that said that 47 people, percent of the people they surveyed with EDs first sought help from their primary care physician. They were happy that materials were ready to go. Very sadly, as the guide was introduced in Austria, my good friend Joan lost her daughter, Erin, to this illness. This gave me even more reason to continue my journey into advocacy. The FEAST Family Guide Task Force began to evolve with the help of Walter Kay and Laura's writing and editing skills. And the first FEAST Symposium was planned and successfully staged. While at the AED in Miami, I was able to meet Debbie Katzman who I had worked with by phone and email during her presidency at AED, and Julie O'Toole, who I had heard and read so much about. In 2011, under the leadership of Debbie Katzman, an expanded second edition of the guide was introduced in Miami, and we had a grand celebration. <laughs> Actually, we were celebrating William and Kate's wedding <laughs> with, Su <laughs> with Susan Ringwood. Yes, that's Laura, Carrie, Arnold, Kitty. We, you're, we've got different hats on here. <laughs> Those were actually bowls she brought from the UK that we turned into. <laughs> and, and that was Kitty, Joan, and myself, along with Susan and her husband, who always, Gary always helped with social plans. These are the people, the authors of the guide. These are the people that helped develop the guide from 2008 to 2011. And as you can see, many of them were people on my yellow brick road. They were very amazing people. Over 75,000 copies of the guide have been distributed around the globe with the help of these and other organizations and many more have been downloaded from various websites. Distribution began with ED organizations around like June Alexander and Company in Australia, and then branched out to other healthcare organizations. We received an endorsement from the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, a major breakthrough into general medicine. Liz Alderman, who chaired the AAP Committee on Adolescence, 
uh, wrote a wonderful article that we found very useful with marketing to the pediatricians. These funded distribution at the AAP with an exhibit booth in Boston, and Kristen Timon from Meta assisted with staffing that booth, Ellen Rome, uh, who was on the Medical Care Task Force, and Liz Alderman invited Laura and I to speak to the Academy's Committee on Adolescence at their business meeting. They were very interested in the guide and in FEAST, and many ordered copies for their hospitals and medical training programs. This was a collaborative effort with AED, FEAST, Meta, and AAP working together. We were now entering mainstream medicine, which was my goal. Laura and I helped the AED distribute the guide at their exhibit booth at the Society of Adolescent Health and Medicine, SAM, in New Orleans. In addition, these sponsored a dessert gathering with SAM ED specialists to foster communication and collaboration. Also at SAM, Laura and I met David Rosen, who was the lead author of the paper you see here, which is the sort of the official guide for EDs for pediatricians in the United States. I continue to encourage AEP members to create a free CME course for pediatricians on the AAP website. And I'm sure that's probably going to happen in Canada, too. <laughs> um, Mark Warren, co-chair of the Medical Care Standards Task Force, and I met with Dasha Nichols, uh, the current president of the AED, to encourage more involvement of the AED in primary physician training. There was a workshop at the, at the uh, academy there that year, and it was presented by Ellen Rome, Ovidia Bermudis, and Rachel Levine. Laura and I also met with Kareen, the founder of the Succeed Foundation in the UK, and Dasha. And a, set, and a new printing of the second edition was introduced with international endorsements. Currently, the guide is being translated into Spanish, French, Italian, Chinese, and Portuguese. This fall, I represented FEAST and the AED at an AEXI exhibit booth at the American College of Emergency Physicians in Denver. Here you see Suzanne Dooley Hash, who is an ER doc and ED specialist, and Joe Christensen, an, an uh, ED psychiatrist who had a background in, in uh, ER training. Suzanne Dooley Hash helped create a poster for the emergency room and also a pamphlet for emergency docs. She will be joining the Medical Care Standards Task Force to fo focus on emergency physician training. The posters and pamphlets are available in the learning room, and um, you can distribute them in your area, or I would recommend the pamphlet for your car in case you ever have to stop in an emergency room with your child might be useful for you. We also went, I also went to the AAP and he supported my travels. I, um, we went to the AAP in New Orleans again. I had never been to New Orleans and I was twice in one year. This was a collaboration effort at its best. I received help from a neighbor. My neighbor traveled with me, helped me set up the booth and in the evening we had a little fun. <laughs> I'm happy to report that pediatricians are beginning to know some basics about EDs. That was, so that was our second year there. Some of them responded and said, you know, I saw this last year, it's been helpful, thank you. Uh, my hope is that pediatricians will begin to expect, demand quality services and stimulate the need for appropriate training of more ED specialists as they did for autism in the 80s. So these are my totals for getting this project started over the last six years. 42,659 miles. That was about 1,800 less than I went for treatment and education for my own daughter. So I have a few more to go, possibly for advocacy. Almost 88,000 miles total. It's been well worth the expenses from my perspective. Travel funds, hotel points, my air miles, <laughs> my time spent away from home because <laughs> the AED has identified the Medical Care Standards Task Force brochure dissemination as a target objective for 2013. <laughs> This project is going 
going on. <laughs> Since the success of this brochure, there has been interest in finding consensus, creating other guides to educate families, general health professionals, and the public. It seems to have set an example of organizations working together cooperatively for the greater good and stimulated the need for more consensus and cooperation. Distribution of the guide brought eating disorders to the attention of general healthcare professionals. Some people have asked me what my secrets to success were. I'd say it'd have to be persistence. <laughs> persistence. Uh, ignoring politically charged confrontations, keeping everyone in for form so they were part of the event, choosing a topic that everyone could get behind and to begin collaborative efforts and consensus, and finding the right people for the job are all very important. important. This is my most recent collaborator, another neighbor who created this PowerPoint for me. <laughs> I can find people to do anything. <laughs> As they say, I get by with a little help from my friends. <laughs> In this spirit of cooperation and collaboration, the first booklet of the Feast Family Guide series, a family guide to the neurobiology of eating disorders, was written and is now available at this meeting and will be available on the Feast website. Um, this is truly a collaborative effort since these, these editors represent many organizations from around the world. They are people that Laura and I have collected <laughs> and developed relationships with over the years. We intentionally selected people from different fields, backgrounds, views, locations, and asked them to create a guide that represented the scientific data known today. They did a beautiful job coming to consensus with the help of Laura's fabulous editing skills. In addition, the Feast Family Guide Task Force is working with the Med AED Medical Care Standards Task Force to publish a family version of the AED Guide to Medical Management. One of the reasons that families are more included recently is because research is, is supporting our involvement. Another is that professionals realize that we're not going away. We are not the problem. We are a very, very big part of the solution. Laura, myself, and many other parents are, have been making ourselves known as the consumers. We ask questions. We let people know our thoughts, needs, and challenge unsupported theories. My we need to have family, families unite for support, education, and advocacy. These are still some of my goals. They really haven't changed. Next year, Debbie Katzman will be the president of SAM and is a past president of AED. She is also professional advisor for FEAST. And I have high hopes, that's as much as I sing, <laughs> of these three international and many other national and regional organizations working collaboratively on many projects. The Yellow Brick Road for Eating Disorders is now under construction. Help support these organizations and Encourage them to collaborate for the common good. Bring other ideas and organizations into the Yellow Brick Road construction. You can help with the development of appropriate treatment for eating disorders. I encourage you to set a goal that matches your talents. Connect to those that can help and stay focused and persist. You know what you can do to help. Let others know your talents and interests and you can make a difference locally, regionally, nationally, and or globally. FEAST can help connect you to the people that can help you reach your goals, and you can help FEAST reach their goals. We can build these roads together. As I move forward, I ask that you keep this in mind, something, something that Edmund Burke said. Nobody makes a, di nobody makes a greater mistake than he who did nothing 
because he could only do a little. And finally, <laughs> that's me, Janet Treasurer style. <laughs> a happy dolphin that now that this presentation is over, <laughs> encouraging you to unite for the cause of quality standard care for eating disorders. And now Laura wants to give her version of how you parents can become involved as collaborators and activists in this new era, how you can get involved with BEAST and other allied organization, organizations, and how your voice is what BEAST is all about. This is just one mom. And she got so much done because she had focus and stamina and air miles. <laughs> there are and there should be families out there doing this kind of work in all kinds of fields. And I think for us in this field, stigma and caregiving burden and guilt have kept a lot of us from stepping forward and doing so. And FEAST is all about empowering families to make, to get involved with treatment, but also to get involved with changing things for the next parents down the line. We've been at this for a long time. Um, uh, our daughter became ill in 2001. So, actually, early 2002. So we've been at this for a while, and you know we're looking at, at moving on you know, in our lives to, lower, to, to other goals too. And I'm seeing a new generation of parents come along who want to get involved, but they're often unsure about what they can do. And I just want you all to know that from my perspective here at Feast, that's our job is to enable that. And there's not one way. And this is, this is one way. And this is one focus and an excellent example. But if you were, you know, monitoring my email and my phone and, and seeing me at meetings, what you'd see is that there are many spokes of people out there that have chosen something that matters to them or have chosen their local region and said, I want to improve things in my town. I want to make things safer for families in my state. I feel like my country um, has policies that I need to change. And then there are international organizations to get involved with, such as AED. And if there is a barrier to doing that for you, that FEAST wants to know how we can make it, uh, how we can facilitate that. And in this meeting, I think I've counted, it's been kind of busy, but I think I've counted five parents who have come up to me and suggested projects. And not, you should do, but I want to do. That is the attitude of feast, is we are only limited by what you are willing to do, and it doesn't have to be a lot, and it doesn't have to cost a lot. Feast runs on shockingly little money. It's not about money. It's about taking, choosing a focus and doing it, but doing it under some sort of principles. And that's another thing Feast has, is we have a set of stated principles, almost like our constitution. And I will confess that parents come to me and say, I want to do X. And sometimes I have to say, that's not really something that w fits within our principles. So it's not a matter of anything that anyone wants to do about anything is going to be effective or is going to be something that fits with what our organization stands for. And our principles come from long negotiations among families. These are family-driven ideas. And I encourage you all to look at our brochure and to look at our website and look at those principles and talk to us about them if you think that they're lacking or they need to add something or, or there's something that troubles you. Because we want this to be about you all. And something that's happening now is the eating disorder advocacy world is changing. I'm about to become an oldie boldie and um, I'm, I'm, I expect to get, you know, uh, pushed aside as as some sort of hidebound person who never lets go of you know that that one thing that she keeps hammering at, that would be the most healthy thing. 
And so we really like to hear from people about, you know, you're emphasizing this or you're not doing that because this isn't about one person or one group of people pounding some agenda. This has been in response to real needs from families and it has been driven by them and we have struggled to stay on a path because this is not always easy. Just like we talked about being a family organization, the family has had fights and we have to be able to challenge one another and say when things aren't working and even uh, speak up to our allies sometimes and say, you know what, you've gone, you've gone away from our original principles. So that's a dynamic process. And uh, one of the things I hear from outside the feast world is that we're very rigid, um, that we only talk about one thing. If you know us well, you know that's just simply not true. But these opportunities to be in, in person with everyone is one of those chances for us to say that, that this is about you. And to that end, I want to I want to get some more feedback from you all. Um, I think most of you know the history of Feast. We started in 2008. It was a group we called the Parent Council. And uh, it was just a group of families. And almost none of us were willing to use our real names. Things have changed. We now have a, 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 a large group of people who are willing to use their names. We're a legal corporation. We have people that are not afraid to take a picture. That used to be completely taboo to take a picture and uh, put it on Facebook, put it on the internet. This is changing. So we're evolving as an, or as an organization. Um, the present of Feast is that I'm moving on from my position and I'm gonna be, become the policy director. And this is an ideal time for us all to talk about different things that we want Feast to do. There's another important part of the history of Feast that, um, that we should always keep in mind is that the only reason that all of us are here is because one person made it possible. And he's standing in the back of the room, and his name is Mark. It's my husband. My husband has kept a job throughout all of what we've been through <laughs> and paid the bills so that I could be a rabble-rousing um, jet setter. And on Thursday, when it was his birthday, I was in Washington doing a congressional briefing, so we will now sing happy birthday to Mark. Aww. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Marky. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> the handsome gentleman next to him is our son, Daniel. <laughs> Another thing that a family organization is, none of us does this without the support of our families. So how many here are parents? When I was looking at the registration, it looked like about, well, okay, I should yeah, say, you have to re start that again. <laughs> parents of eating disorder patients, past, present, or future. Still. Um, how many parents felt that they had the information they needed when their child first became ill. I found you. I found you the day my daughter told you. I wow. found you the day my daughter told you. Oh. Awesome. This for you. Awesome. I don't know if that was the first place to start. But this is, we'd like to see, that, that, would, be, that would be great. But um, I'm taking it that the majority of you did not feel equipped when you started. So it's FEAST's job to try to build an environment, both peer support and in the professional world and in our media um, and in society that helps families. So FEAST does that through the kind of work that we support Mary Beth in doing. It also um, supports you in just having a, an open forum for you all to share information with one another peer to peer. It supports you in, um, I have been showing up 
at eating disorder conferences since I met Doug at Ophelia's place in what, 2000? Yeah, it was long. Time ago. Um, showing up um, has been really important and it used to just be a few of us and I want to encourage everyone to kind of look at the different ways that Feast is out there and choose something. Choose a coffee break. We have a, an informal coffee break program where you can form a group in your local area just to meet together. It's not treatment. It's not to you know enforce a certain kind of treatment. It's for you just to get out there and meet other families and then develop a knowledge base and a, a, a community of knowledge in your area. We also support um, just education on our website, which is very inexpensive, and we, I think we do that very well. But I'd like to hear from you all um, some ideas and some examples, like Mary Beth, where you've done something either locally or in a field of interest of yours so that we can all be inspired by that and get ideas about how each of us can do that. Oh, and I want to ask that you do it on, uh, use the microphone because the, we, that needs to be picked up. So. examples of things that you've been able to do that you would like to talk about and inspire others about. So um, our son is a senior now in high school and when this all started we talked a lot to the school um, principals and the school nurse. So I've had a good relationship with the high school nurse and I've told her anytime she wanted to to give my name to any parent who might have interest or need, and then that they could call me. And she would always prep me and say, can I really give your name to so-and-so? They may or may not call you. Well, probably about a few months ago, a, a mother did call. And so we had her in our home, and we gave her information, and we told her about the magic plate, and we told her about the Feast website, and she didn't have the energy to look at the website. She just couldn't take time to do that. But I saw her, she was going to come today, and then just couldn't. But I, I called her two days, the day before yesterday, when she told me she wouldn't be able to come. And she said her child has gained significant weight. She is using the magic plate. And she said, Sue, you've saved my daughter's life. And I said, well, Laura Collins saved my son's life. It took us three months to find peace and Laura. But that first phone call did save our son's life. So I said to this mom, and you will save somebody else's life. She said, I sure hope so. I said, you will, just by being willing to talk about it to other people. So let your school nurses know that you're here. <coughs> I'm Colleen hold, Wise. Hold the microphone very close, everyone. I'm Colleen Wise. And um, some of the things that I've done is in Seattle, we have kind of a lot of people for some reason with eating disorders. Probably the rain. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, connecting with those people has been really great. And we have a good Northwest contingent represented here today. But we meet month monthly at uh, Delfino's Pizza in U Village at noon. Welcome to join us. Um, and that's been really helpful, I think. The AED booklets are fantastic, and MB is really great about mailing me more and more. So I just pass those out by the handful. I call myself Johnny Information Seed, <laughs> and I just <laughs> scatter those AED booklets wherever I can. Um, I've given a lot of them to school nurses, and I give my cell phone number and contact information to the school nurses. The school nurse contacted me last week about a parent that that needed some help and guidance because, you know, it's just not out there. Um, what else? Oh, you know, some of the goals that, that come to my mind that I would like to do personally. In the state of Washington, the age of consent for psychiatric illnesses is 13. We can't 
legally force our children into treatment, we can use the leverage we have, which can be pretty uh, substantial. But I would like to see that law changed, at least in the case of eating disorders. Um, the other thing I would like to do personally is, as a moderator on the Around the Dinner Table Forum, and having been there for four and a half years, I see a large collective body of wisdom about our experiences and what we're seeing that goes beyond basic FBT. I would like to somehow give researchers and treatment um, developers the parent perspective on what's happening so that we can all work together to improve outcomes. So, thank you. Um, I'm Axa Carnes, and we, we were fortunate, yes and no, um, that we immediately from day one heard about the term Motsley, but we didn't know how to do it for 18 months until I you know, started with the forum in 2007. We were able to find someone who said she was FBT, but she didn't give us any tools. But with working together, we kind of, you know, I trained her and she worked along me. And then afterwards, she contacted me and she said, we're starting an eating disorder coalition in South Carolina and I want you to be a part of it. So we have been working together and meeting and um, I have been a little discouraged before this conference because, uh, please, don't be offended. It's, I don't really know a lot about this. I just know, you know, FBT, we refer to our child, that's the w breadth of my experience. But our organization wants to be a part of NIDA, and I was like, oh, you know, I don't know about that. And, you know, it wasn't my vision. But just hearing you talk, Mary Beth, has just really inspired me um, to really continue being a part of that and see what difference I can make um, you know, from what I bring to the table. And I know, see, the thing about the therapist is she has to be, um, you know, she's this umbrella person and she has to work and collaborate with everybody. But I know she has me there because of what our experience with our child through, you know, family based therapy. So, anyway, I think my goal is, for example, we're going to have a NIDA walk, which I'm a part of, you know, helping out. And I think I have some of the booklets left over from the AD. I'm going to bring them to the walk. They can bring there. You oh, can, to, you okay. can get them right through Nita. Okay. And I, I kind of call myself the Switzerland of volunteers. Yeah. You know, I just, I, wherever I can get the job done is good for yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> and we have I, to get everybody working together. Yeah. You know, so, and, and then my uh, uh, therapist also gives out my name to parents who are floundering, and I get, I've gotten maybe five or six calls from, the, and my daughter's been in recovery five years. So, anyway, I'm working with my community. Most of you know that I'm Laura's mother-in-law, but I would love to see some form of a publication that the grandparents can have. We can speak, you know, we can speak two sides. We have to be very careful. My daughter-in-law doesn't know what she's doing, but my son is doing great. Or, <laughs> or, or vice versa. Because we, we don't know what an eating disorder is. I was totally oblivious to it. We're a generation that we suffered from it, we didn't know. And if we could have the information, there's nothing better than the telegraph system from the grandparents. When they go to meetings, they can spread more wonderful information. So I would like us to see something like that. I can, I can commit to that project right now. I, um, I'm Michelle. I'm, uh, I talked to Laura a little bit about this yesterday. Um, last two years ago when I was in nursing school back for my BSN um, and my daughter was in the throes of treatment, uh, my research project was about um, eating disorders and identifying them because, again, I, I missed it. It was somebody who came and told, told me. And as a nurse um, and a pediatric nurse for the past 25 years, I really want to work on how do we help educate those people, school nurses, um, uh, coaches, teachers, to 
screen, sent, you know, what, what things should they be seeing to help before we have to intervene with refeeding? What are, what are, what are the needs there? Um, so ta tacking into nurses. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joan Reeder, and I just want to, everyone in this room, we've got all this wonderful information that is right across the hall. We're talking about our pamphlets, we're talking about our posters. I have taken it, my, one of my missions is to get to our medical college. If we, everyone in their area takes the, that material and makes an appointment to talk with their chair of psychiatry, and they most most often will will see you go with this group, and they are more more than willing to distribute this information to their medical students and talk to them about this drastic need. And go to your emergency rooms with the poster and say, or I would say, go to the head emergency room physician. You're going to get the best response if you talk to them and they distribute it in their emergency room. We all can do that. Hi, my name is Carolyn, and my daughter, Caitlin, has been um, in recovery for about a year. I have no idea exactly how, because we didn't, we didn't know about FDT during, during our 10-year journey. And I'm also a practitioner now family therapist at a treatment center. And it's so funny what you mentioned because I wrote down, I want to educate doctors and dentists in my area of high, and, uh, high school and middle school counselors about FBT and also about the, um, the uh, standard of practice. You know, so I'm committing to going to the emergency rooms and to the doctors, the pediatricians, the family practitioners in our area and make sure that they know the standard of practice My name is Sharon Peterson. First and foremost, I am a recovered bulimic. I was ill in the 1980s, long before we had the abundance of resources that you all are so fortunate enough to have. I'm also a clinical social worker. I'm in private practice in Baltimore. Um, my, half my caseload is eating disorders. And because I had so much free time, I decided to start a nonprofit during the recession. <laughs> which was a really smart move that I made. Um, and it's called Eating Disorder Network of Maryland, and we are part of the National Eating Disorder Association. We're part of the NEDA Network. Um, I have with me Rick Deese, who is our newly elected board member, who is a parent. We now have two parents, two fathers on our board. Um, at e we call ourselves Eden, Maryland. At Eden, Maryland, we don't claim to know everything. All we are is a very small, tiny, but growing nonprofit that provides information and community outreach. If anybody in here is from Maryland, D.C., and Northern Virginia, please find one of us because one of the things that we're trying to do this year is have more services for parents and family members. So we would love to hear some ideas and work collaboratively with you. We don't think we're up here and everybody else is down there. Um, so if you're interested in, in um, finding more ways to reach the people in the Maryland, D.C. and the Northern Virginia area, please check us out. Thank you. Uh, Johan Zimmerman, the parent of the high school senior that Sue just talked about. Uh, yesterday we talked about the media and how do we approach this negative media, media images. Well, I won't tell this to you people, but my son, he runs cross country, and when he won districts, right away in the newspaper, out comes his weight and his height, comparing him to the others, and he weighs 30 pounds more than anybody else running, but he's still winning, but that same week, he had a real difficult time eating. So instead of going, I had to calm myself, not take my baseball bat to the next meet. 
But I just approached the, the, the reporter and told him about, the, I didn't say it was my son, I just told him about the emerging issue of this, especially with cross country runners. And after that, no more weights and heights were published for the rest of the season. <laughs> We, we actually, um, we're at zero, and it's lunchtime, but take it, take this energy, these ideas to lunch. Oh, wait, wait, one minute. One minute. We're going to go over time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, this, this I take time for. I think many of you know that my father has been at the registration desk, um, and he's been watching.